we are back and this is our next session in our book Bible survey and in this lesson this is lesson number four and we're gonna give you a survey of the wisdom literature and the poetic books so these are the books after the historical books and this is a different type of literature which should be interpreted differently than the historic books. Historic books gives us facts, poetry and wisdom literature gives us principles and help us to understand different topics like suffering, emotions, joy, love and so forth. So you can turn in your books to page 48 and you'll see these books are very important for us to understand man's dealing and interpretations of circumstances and understanding God's dealing with us as human beings. It's highly emotional and it helps us to discover our own emotions and how to deal with the emotions. So we have the book of Job which deals with suffering and we will have a quick overview of that then the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastics and Songs which is traditionally it is given to Solomon as the books open with the words these are the words of Solomon and we all know that King Solomon when he became the king he asked God not for wealth or for power but for wisdom and God granted him the wisdom and he was seen as the wisest of all men that ever lived. So these books are beautiful, they're full of poetry and then the book of Song of Songs gives us an overview of romantic love and especially sex in marriage and the beauty of what God created an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife and the fulfillment that sex is supposed to give us and then also the warning as Proverbs tells us about the danger of sex outside the marriage. So these are the books we're going to have a look today. On page 49 there's some important literature principles that you need to understand that will assist you to interpret it correctly. So the first one is Hebrew parallelism. It is a way the Hebrew people used to emphasize things by saying the same thing twice in different ways. There you can see Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? So it is synonyms. The same thing is said twice but with different wording. So in the Hebrew language it will be poetic, it will rhyme and it will sound beautiful on the ears but because we don't read the Hebrew, we read English, we don't always understand it because if you said poetry and it rhymes the moment you translate it you find the meaning and the beautiful sounds get lost. Then there's contrastive parallelism, for example, Proverbs 10 said, A wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. So wise is contrasted with foolish and make the father glad, make the mother sorrowful. The second one is questions that's often asked. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around him. So the question is, what does the fire do? Or who is affected by the fire? And then Psalm 25. Of you are the God of, of for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. So the question is, how is my profession that God is the God of my salvation demonstrated? So these poetics writings causes us to think deeply about life. 
Proverbs, another beautiful contrast at the bottom of the page. For the simple are killed by turning away, and the complacency of fools destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. So there's a relationship between these lines. There's four lines. The first two is synonyms. The second two is synonyms. Same thing is said twice. And then it's contrasted. So these are beautiful literature things and styles that you could start to learn to pick up when you read through the wisdom literature. The first important book is of course Proverbs. And Proverbs is a very nice book to read to your children when they're between the age of 6 and 12. And it's very wise to read it quite often. You must read that as a leader because it's written by Solomon for his children, the young princes, to instruct them. And some of these wisdoms was given by David to young Solomon. So it's very wise sayings and phrases. And if we apply them to our life, we will benefit the fruit of that. So the key is, of course, the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Is it to be afraid of God or to stand in awe of him? And he explains it to us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it means that if you want to be wise, you must realize deep in your heart that one day you will stand before God and you will give account for what you do. So do everything with that. One day you will give account. And that will cause you to do things differently. It is given to the sons the wise sons of Solomon, or he hoped to make his sons wiser. So if you look at the outline, the first major theme is the fear of the Lord or the knowledge of God. Proverbs 14 verse 26 and 7, the fear of the Lord produces strong confidence. It's a fountain of life that, may, that one may turn away from the snares of death. So things to deeply consider. Proverbs 15 verse 16 on page 51. Better a little with fear of the Lord than a great treasure and trouble with it. So all these aspects concerns the wisdom and the fear of God. So the first seven Verses of the first chapter talks about the fear of God as the fountain to a godly life. Then it talks about folly and it warns us as men against the danger of adulterous women who try to deceive us. And beautiful for us to remember that we must always be on guard not to be tempted sexually and fall for adulterous relationship outside marriage. Then Proverbs 10 to 20, so Proverbs of Solomon, talks about righteousness, the king and the Lord, and wisdom must be collected over a lifetime. Make it one of your life goals to become wise. Wisdom gives you long standing, wisdom gives you authority. People need wisdom in today's world. Without God, the world falls into foolishness. Proverbs 22 to 24 is warnings. How should a house be built? Good ideas for us as families. What is the principles on which we build a house? Proverbs 25 to 29 is a collection of Ezekiel's uh, collection of Solomon's Proverbs. It talks about the king, the fool and the sluggard, the lazy person. It talks about friendship and speech and the priority to work hard. And then 30 to 31 is the Proverbs of Acher and Lemuel's mother. And it talks about humility, not to be proud and arrogant, but to be humble. And then chapter 31, verse 10 to 31, talks about the godly wife. So these wisdom literature is a collection of wise sayings for us to help us. It is specifically written for young people, but also for us who is older, to 
to remind us how we should construct our lives and what is important in life. And it is beautiful poetry to read and relax and think about life. Then we come to the book of Job. Now the book of Job is a topic of suffering which sometimes we hesitate to think about because we don't understand suffering always and this is a beautiful story about what be happens behind the scenes and the story is in heaven Satan is in front of God and he accuses Job because God is so impressed with him because he's a righteous man and first God told Satan but there is no man on this whole earth like my servant Job and then Satan said but just take away his stuff, just take away his material positions. And God gave permission to Satan to do that. And in one day, Job loses all his material possessions and his children. And Job was totally unaware of the story. And then again, Satan comes before God and he said, but just take away his health and then he will curse you. And then we see that Job discovered the true meaning of life and how he battled with understanding suffering and it is for us important to understand that and these players that plays their role and give their ideas and the first is three elderly men and each one have an interpretation of what is suffering about and the first one is Elias the Temanite and his explanation is God is suffering, uh, Job is suffering because he has sinned Chapter 5, verse 8 says, Go to God and confess your sin. And then Job answered him in chapter 6, verse 29, Stop assuming my guilt, for I am righteous. Job didn't understand what was happening. So that is the first view of suffering. When we suffer, it's because we have sinned. If that is true, we need to look at confess our sin. But if it's not true, maybe there's another reason. Saying, then build that. The second player, he accuses Job sin because he don't admit he had sinned. He is stubborn. Just admit you had sinned. He said, how long will you go on this? In chapter 8 verse 2. And then Job said, I will say, God, tell me why are you doing this? So he, his view is Job don't admit he had sinned. Then Zohar, he said, Job deserves even more punishment because he doesn't understand he had sinned. He said, Job's sin deserves even more suffering than his experience. He said in chapter 11 verse 13, get rid of your sin. And Job said, I know I'm righteous. And then there's a fourth player, a young man called Elihu. And he said, God is using suffering to mold Job and you must keep silent and learn wisdom and then God come to the to the picture in chapter 38 and he rebuked Job's three friends for their foolishness and then he revealed himself to Job but he never explained to Job why did Job suffer God said to Job in chapter 42 verse 2 do you still argue with the Almighty and then God told him a lot of wonderful mysterious things and then at the end Job said I was talking about things I knew nothing about and then the beautiful saying and the Lord changed Lot's circumstances when he prayed for his friends Something about forgiveness, something not to build bitterness. So Job prayed for his friends and then to the Lord changed his circumstances and gave him twice as much as he had before. A beautiful story of how we as humans understand suffering or we are struggling with suffering. So we found a lot of comfort in the book of Job. That brings us to the book of Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastics is the preacher, the preacher who shares 
his knowledge about the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? And sometimes when we get older, we ask and we reflect, did I have a meaningful life? What am I leaving behind? What legacy am I leaving behind? So the, the book of Ecclesiastics is also divided into parts. You can see there in page 57, the preacher, the son of David, and the message is listen. Listen to these wise sayings. Read through that. And then, of course, the life of endless repetition. A time for this, a time for this, and the meaningless of life. And sometimes we go through seasons in our lives where we just don't see meaning. Because maybe we have invested in the wrong things. We've invested in materialistic things and not in people. And we realize that when we leave this earth, I have nothing to take with me. But if we invest in people, we have treasures in heaven. And there's also God's sovereignty, sovereignty Ecclesiastics chapter 3 to 5 talks about the objectance of God's sovereignty. Then of course the danger of envy and pity. Envy is when you envious of other people and then not to fall into depression in pity yourself but to pick up yourself and then be aware of self-righteousness and self-wisdom. Make wise judgments and then Beautiful, love your wife, work hard and plan ahead. Some good wisdom for us to share in the book of Ecclesiastics. So, love your life, work hard and prepare ahead for old age. Don't, get, don't let time catches you. That brings us to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is five roles, five roles in the old times. They didn't have books like we had, they had rolls, they rolled them up. So the book of Psalms, because they're so long, it's the longest book in the Bible. It's got 150 chapters and it's divided in five pieces. So the biggest contributor to the Psalms is of course King David and through the different seasons in his life. Like the first book, Psalm 1 to Psalm 41, is the troubles David went through before he became the king. So we have Psalm 1, the individual's faith, and then the nation's response to God. The key verse there is chapter 41, or Psalm 41, verse 12 and 13. You upheld me, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and Amen. These were traditionally songs they used to sing sing in the temple. Some of them they sang daily, some of them they sing through the year, but it was songs to be repeated and sung in the congregation. It was their hymns which they sung. The second book talks about the glory of the united monarchy. That's Psalm 42 to Psalm 72. And the theme there, Psalm 72, Blessed be the glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. The prayers of David, the son of J. Jesse, are ended. The next book, Psalm 73 to 89, that was in the Babylonian captivity, stories about Israel's unbelief, and then of course the Psalm of Asaph. Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and Amen. They all end with Amen and Amen. Then the returning re remnant and the glory of God. Two very important Psalms. Is Psalm 90, the song of Moses. We all know Psalm 91 for protection. And the key Psalm there is Psalm 106, which is save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us among the nations, blessed be the name, ach, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Last book, the future glory and the messianic hope, and then Psalm 107, Psalm 120, Psalm 121, all beautiful psalms, and Psalm 150, the last psalm said, Praise, 
the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. And the last one, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So, on page 59, you see different types of psalms. You see laments, it's songs that is sad, people crying out before God to intervene, to come and help them. There's narrative praise. We see descriptive praises, pilgrimage songs, royal messianic songs, wisdom psalms, and songs of war. So all different types of psalms. And it is good to read the psalm every day. It's beautiful. It fills us with joy. And it's so easy to understand and to pray through them. That brings us to the last book. And that is the book of the Song of Solomon. So it is written by Solomon. And it is the story of an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And we find so many good uh, understandings how a man should understand a woman and how a woman interpret a man. So a lot of things sometimes we said our oh, man will never understand a woman or they will never understand their wives. But if you read the Song of Songs you'll see some key ways to understand a woman better. How a woman wants to be praised, how a woman wants to be emotionally encouraged, how she wants to know that she is the love of your life and then how she reflect towards the man and longs for emotional support so beautiful song it is divided into a few songs the first song is the greatest song is a love story then anticipation the bride and the groom speak to each other through their friends as love is awakened and growing for the writer. A story about courtship that you should not awaken love before it's the proper time, get into a proper relationship, understand each other, build each other up and then at the right time get married and to have an intimate, sexual, meaningful relationship with your wife. Then we have the story of the broom calls away the bride to come away. And then she has a nightmare that he is lost, but she finds him. Deep inside, all of us have a longing for being loved. Being loved emotionally, physically, and mentally. Deep in our life, we need somebody to be close to us. And the closest relationship we have is between a husband and a wife. Then song chapter 6 to chapter 5 is 1. The bride and the groom are united in the garden and consummated their love. Then the next one is lost and found. The bride has a nightmare that the groom is lost, yet they return again to the garden for mutual delight. So we see this poetic song about sexual love and relationship and the things that contribute and the things that hinders that. And then the last one. The greatest love is revealed at last. It's not in the wilderness, but in the garden. So read through that with your wife. Go through that and you'll discover most beautiful meaning to have an intimate relationship and the joy of sex, the gift that God has given married people. So review questions. What is the message of Proverbs? Number four, what is the message of Job? Question you can ask yourself number five in job 28 job asked the question where can wisdom be found and where is understanding what are three truths did he conclude from his reflection go through that read together discuss that as a group what is a lament and what is your emotional uh, situation are you joyful are you happy do you have emotional struggle and share that with one another Pray with one another. Said, I'm going through this. Have you read this psalm? Just think about how psalms can contribute to our emotional standing where we are. And then the last one, what is the message of songs? So my friends, be blessed. Remember the wisdom literature in the Bible is there to uplift us, to 
contribute to our mental health, to our emotional health, and to help us to find meaning in the so many questions that we don't understand. May God bless you.